I'm nervous like everybody else, and I see all the issues we have, which is uh, pretty plentiful. Some of the trends going into the Ukraine crisis really just extended. We have just too many supply side disruptions uh, involved in this conflict. That's the uh, one of the challenges right now is trying to see if Russia is open to an exit ramp or if Putin is actually going to accelerate things even further. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 9 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, March 21st. Our top stories today. Jetliner disaster in China. A government-owned media outlet reports that a Boeing 737 with 133 people on board has crashed. The war in Ukraine enters a deadly new phase as Russia's ground campaign gets bogged down. Moscow has begun using hypersonic missiles. Attention focuses on Mariupol. And President Biden will hold a phone call today with the leaders of the UK, France, Italy and Germany. They will discuss a coordinated response to the latest developments in the war. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Uh, so much uh, uh, sad news to talk about, in, uh, as, as seems to be often the case at the moment. Kaylee, of course, the ongoing war in Ukraine is front and centre. We now have a, uh, a, a, an aircraft crashing in China as well. Seems almost trite to talk in all of this context about the markets, but we have to do that. Uh, markets perhaps a little calmer than they were last week. Yeah, well, of course, last week was the best week, at least for U.S. equity markets, going back to November of 2020. It's a little bit less of a risk on tone as we start this new week, though, Anna. And that was definitely true in Asia overnight, where stocks were down by about half of 1% when it comes to the MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole. Japan was closed for a holiday, but South Korea, China, Hong Kong, all of those stocks lower in China and Hong Kong. They're still looking for evidence that Beijing is going to back up its verbal intervention last week to support financial markets. One individual stock I did want to mention is Rusal, of course, the Russian aluminum company. We had Australia over the weekend announcing a ban of exports of alumina to Russia. That could have a direct impact on Rusal's business. So that stock was down about 5.4% in Hong Kong as a result. You saw a resulting uh, spike upward in aluminum futures in Shanghai as well. And then finally, in FX, I wanted to point to the South Korean won, the big underperformer in Asia, weaker against the dollar by about three quarters of a percent after we got trade data, preliminary data out overnight shows a big deficit could be heading for South Korea as the import prices for commodities and energy surge a lot higher, Matt. All right, Kaylee, definitely interesting to watch um, the currencies today, especially those that are thought of as safe havens. It's a bit of a risk off morning, and this is just the start of it. In fact, um, this is one of the best positions I've seen S&P futures in over the last couple of hours. So right now only down by about two tenths of one percent. U.S. 10 year yield is being um, pushed up as investors sell that off. So very interesting uh, look at risk there. Twenty one or sorry, two spot one eight five. Two is the 10 year yield. We'll be watching as the belly of the curve um, inverted. We'll be watching the sort of plain vanilla spreads, twos, tens, five thirties, et cetera. They're still um, a positive, but they are uh, certainly flattening. Uh, look at NYMEX crude right now, up another 5% this morning, back up to 110, basically at 109.63. So that could be something else that concerns investors today, along with the war concerns, along with um, the plane crash, along with the, the COVID continued COVID restrictions in Hong Kong and Bitcoin down about two tenths of one percent. So not really moving much at all and still at a relatively high level, 41,227. Anna? Yeah, big focus on that higher oil price here in Europe as well, Matt. And perhaps that is taking the edge off risk appetite in some of these European equity markets, maybe in the uh, French market and the German market, for example, where we uh, see some movements to the downside. The London market, though, getting the benefit of that higher oil price and also some moves to the upside for commodity names, for basic resource stocks taking place in London. Let's roll over and show you some of the other commodities in focus today. This is aluminium in London or aluminum, and this is up by 3.8%. It's been up as much as 5% on the LME overnight and this is all to do with the evolving sanctions situation so we haven't heard the last on which of uh, on how Russia is involved in the in in the sanction story in terms of metals Canberra in Australia saying that they don't want to export alumina uh, to Russia anymore and as a result that is putting a, a, an upward pressure on the end destination product for alumina which is uh, which is aluminium of course nickel is down by 15 percent uh, this is limit down this is the new limit down that we have in place today down by 15 percent but that move 
has taken the LME price back down towards the price that we've seen in Shanghai. So perhaps we're getting closer to normality when it comes to those nickel prices. NL is a stock in Italy, of course, that plays in the energy space, up by 1.3% this morning after the CEO confirmed that this is another business that is going to exit from Russia. They're talking about doing that within months. And talking of the same theme, Nestle in focus, down by half a percent. They have already said that they won't send non-essential items to Russia, so they're not sending Nespresso capsules and they are uh, not selling bottled water, but they are selling food and they are selling uh, some of the other uh, items that they make, such as baby formula. And they are under political pressure to review that policy. Kaylee. Yeah, there's a lot of political pressure out there for these companies as the war rages on. Now, let's take a look at what else is ahead this week. It's already a busy Monday. There is a lot more to come. The Fed's Jay Powell and Rafael Bostic will both be speaking at the National Association for Business Economics Conference in Washington later on today. Also today, the Senate hearing for President Biden's Supreme Court pick, Katanji Brown-Jackson, will begin. UK Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak delivers his spring statement on Wednesday. Also on Wednesday, China's tech giant Tencent will be reporting its earning results. And finally, as we know, President Biden will be heading to Europe to meet with allies on Thursday, Matt. All right, we are getting some headlines as well right now from the Kremlin, Kaylee. The uh, spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, is saying that progress in talks on Ukraine um, are yielding less than we would like. That's a direct quote, less than we would like in terms of uh, progress on the war talks, um, peace talks, hopefully. No agreements have been reached yet in those negotiations, but the Kremlin says an EU oil embargo, or an embargo on Russian oil, I should say, from the EU, would hit everyone. Again, those lines coming in now from the Kremlin. Russia's use of hypersonic missiles against Ukraine appears to mark a shift in strategy. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin spoke on CBS's Face the Nation yesterday. I would not see it as a game changer. Uh, I think, uh, again, the reason that he's resorting to using these types of weapons is because he's trying to reestablish some momentum. Let's get more with our reporters from around the world. We have uh, people placed in Poland right now, in Washington, D.C., in Brussels and in London. But we'll start with Bloomberg's Agatha Cantrill, who is on the ground. She joins us from um, a depot in Tsishuf, Poland, where the UNHCR and World Food Program have been shipping out crucial supplies to Ukraine. Aggie, what's the situation on the ground right now? Yes, Matt. So on the situation on the ground in Ukraine, there is a lot to talk about, but I think this morning we have to focus on Mariupol, where they have rejected this effort, uh, this ultimatum on behalf of the Russians to push the city to surrender. There is, uh, from the figures last week, there are 350,000 people still in the city of Mariupol, where now there is a real concern over a complete lack of crucial infrastructure, including access to water and even food. And Aggie, you've moved from the border to this UNHCR depot to uh, keep track of the relief effort that's being supplied to people within Ukraine and also to those displaced into Poland. Uh, what's the latest on that? Yes, so this depot here is being used by the World Food Programme and the UNHCR in collaboration with each other um, in order to secure huge amounts of supplies to Ukraine. The World Food Programme has already, not just at this location, but more broadly, they have already purchased 24,000 metric tons of food, which is going to people in Ukraine and also to the surrounding areas where a lot of refugees are coming over the border. And then when you look at the UNHCR's projects, in this depot alone, they're providing, they're collecting blankets and mattresses and also things like solar lamps and jerry cans in order to provide alternative measures to support people who are uh, struggling with a lack of energy and a lack of food in Ukraine. This stuff will be going from uh, this depot here to places like Lviv and Uzhorod on the border uh, inside Ukraine, but on the western border, and then will be passed on into the more uh, affected areas like Kiev and the east of the country. All right, an important effort to help with that humanitarian crisis. Thank you so much, Bloomberg's Aggie Kentrell reporting from Poland. Meanwhile, of course, President Biden and President Xi Jinping P Ping of China talked on Friday. And after that conversation, China's top envoy to Washington pledged that his country will do everything to de-escalate the war in Ukraine. He spoke on CBS's Face the Nation yesterday. There's a, a disinformation about China providing military assistance to Russia. We are against the war, as I said. You know, we 
will do everything to de-escalate mm -hmm. the crisis. And President Biden will get back on the phone today. He's set to host a call on Ukraine with the leaders of the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. Let's get to the latest from DC now with Anne Marie Hordern, our Washington correspondent. So, Anne Marie, what's the purpose of today's call ahead of his travel to Europe later this week? Well, all we know from the White House, this is about the United States, along with their Western allies, coordinated response when it comes to Russia's war on Ukraine. But the timing, Kaylee, is interesting and really have, as you outlined there, the president on Friday spoke to Xi Jinping, and the United States is going to be speaking to its key European allies ahead of the EU sits down with China on April 1st. And really, part of this has to be about making sure that the European Union tells the same lies the United States when it comes to China, meaning they want to put pressure on Beijing to not help President Putin, whether that's about skirting around sanctions or also providing military support. And then, of course, this meeting comes just days ahead of the president will be sitting with them in person for the NATO, the EU, and as well as the G7 summit. What do we know, Emory, um, here stateside about a meeting involving Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and a number of corporate leaders? So this is going to be an interesting meeting because a number of firms from the energy space as well as banking will be in this meeting. So the likes of Exxon, ConocoPhillips, Marathon Petroleum, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America. And they're going to discuss really the sanctions and the impact the sanctions have had on companies and also just the global marketplace. This is really twofold. One is that the penalties on Russia have really created some havoc when it comes to supply chains and global commodity prices. Second, this administration is calling on producers to actually pump more. So I think it's going to be incredibly interesting to see what happens in this conversation, especially as they've been criticized in these producers for wanting to also make sure that uh, these companies say that they are putting more money back to shareholders and not investing more. And this administration is asking them to do just that. So that's what kind of meeting mm. it is. But it is, of course, uh, close to the press. We'll start to see what we can get out of it. Amory, thank you very much, Bloomberg's Amory Hordern on the relationship between government and corporates in the U.S. Now, EU leaders may hold off on endorsing intervention in the bloc's wholesale energy market. Joining us from Brussels is our European correspondent Maria Tadeo from Brussels. Tell us more about that and the search by European countries for alternatives to Russian gas. Of course, there's a short-term uh, measures and then there's the long-term search. Yes, and Anna, just before we get there, uh, we, we have seen European uh, foreign ministers uh, go behind me in this carpet just a few minutes ago. The top European diplomat uh, also participated in uh, this uh, Q&A that we just did, and it's interesting to me to hear the change in the language from the European side, which now says for the first time uh, since the crisis started that Russia has committed, quote, massive war crimes. So this is now really now matching up to the language uh, coming out of the United States. Now, they also say, and we've reported this to that the European Union will pursue a similar line to that of the United States when it comes to China. So you see that the two sides are aligning ahead of this uh, meeting that is set to take place here on Thursday with the President of the United States. Now, when it comes to energy, there's one thing that really caught my attention this morning, and that is European foreign ministers are bringing back this idea of an imports ban from European uh, purchases of Russian gas and oil, saying that this situation could be further debated on Thursday, that it is not a done deal, and that they still believe there's many ways in which the European Union could tackle uh, the Russian war machine. That is, of course, the oil and gas that they sell to the European Union. I had one uh, minister in particular who told me by now it is obvious that there are many loopholes in our sanctions and, quote, we have to close them. Whether that means a full ban or not, we'll have to wait and see by the end of the week. But my impression is that this debate has been really reinvigorated over the past 24 hours. It is not a done deal uh, when it comes to uh, energy here in Europe. Thanks very much, Maria. Our colleague uh, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo on the ground for us in Brussels. Let us talk about what uh, the markets are doing in the context of all of this uh, geopolitical development. Oil surging for a third day as tensions in Saudi Arabia add pressure to supplies already tightened by the war in Ukraine. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has more. Danny. Anna, yes, it's the third day that we're seeing oil move higher. 4%, 4% plus in some WTI and Brent contracts. And to be clear, since we fell from the peak match earlier in March, there has some, been some confusion as to why. It fell about 20% in six days. The fundamental story hasn't really changed. There's still the self-sanctioning. There's still more demand. There's still issues with supply. So 
that was a confusing picture, but over the past few days and even this morning, we've gotten this reinforced picture that shows the bias of direction in oil is higher. For one, you had a Houthi rebel attack in Saudi on Ramco sites. Now, there's not any signs that that hindered output of oil, but of course, those sorts of geopolitical tensions certainly add to the price of oil. We also have China relaxing some COVID restrictions. Shenzhen is opening yet again. Flight restrictions in Hong Kong are being eased. That demand side of the picture also puts pushing oil higher and of course there still is so much uncertainty over this war the progress of talks what sort of sanctions as Maria was discussing will be placed on Russian energy alongside the self-sanctioning so this unknown picture keeping oil pushing higher today all right Danny thanks very much Danny Berger there looking at the moves in commodities now let's get to the breaking news a Boeing 737 plane operated by China Eastern Airlines has crashed with crashed with 133 people on board in China's southwestern province province of Guangxi Bloomberg Airlines reporter Sid Phillip joins us now to tell us what we know and Sid, maybe a little on the history of the 737 as well because those are numbers that pop up ominously. Sure, morning. So, uh, yes, the the play we information is still pretty scarce at the moment, but we do know that China Eastern Flight MU5735 that was traveling from Kunming to Guangzhou, and we see that radar tracking data showing that the plane taking a steep descent, and the China Aviation Administration has said there's about 123 passengers and nine crew members on board. We don't know yet about casualties or injuries, if any. And we're still, this is obviously the 737NG. This is not the 737 MAX, which was involved in those two high-profile crashes that led to its grounding. But this is the previous model. And it is one of the safest jetliners in the world. And <clears throat> through 2018, there's been about eight fatal crashes for the model. So this is pretty early at the moment. And we'll sort of keep you informed as we get more and more on it. All right. Well, we will look out for those updates. Thank you so much to Bloomberg Airlines reporter Sid Phillip for reporting on this breaking news. Now, we had it up on the screen, but I will just reiterate it for our radio audience. Boeing is a stock on the move in pre-market trading. Right now, those shares are down the better part of 7% before the bell. So we will continue to watch the stock as the story evolves. Another stock moving to the downside is Nielsen. It has rejected an acquisition offer from PE uh, companies, including Elliott. Uh, that had valued the company at $24.50 a share. Nielsen saying that doesn't give adequate value to shareholders. The stock was up 40% on the prospect of a deal last week, but it is sinking to the downside by 12% in early hours this morning. But one deal that is going ahead and is uh, seeing a stock move as a result is Anaplan. This is a software company getting bought by Tama Bravo, about a 30% premium to Friday's closing price, uh, around $66 a share. Right now it's trading at $64, higher by nearly 27% before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, coming up on the program, Kiran Ganesh, UBS Global Wealth Management, Global Head of Investment Communications, joins us. We'll get his thoughts on strategy. And on Ukraine, Adam Tooze, Columbia University Professor of History, joins us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Let's take a look right now at the plain vanilla curves. I was saying earlier that we've seen the belly invert. So the threes, tens, the fives, tens, and the sevens, tens have inverted. But we still have um, the, the plain vanilla curves um, yet to do that, yet to make that move. You've got the... Uh, um, Twos, tens, the fives, thirties. Sorry, I'm just looking at this chart, which I believe is the wrong one. No, Kaylee, but it's also a great chart. Volatility is <laughs> coming down. <laughs> curves are flattening. I think we have someone with us, Matt, that can discuss all of it. Yeah, I'm sure it's my fault either way. Uh, <laughs> Kriti Gupta is here to save us from this situation. Bloomberg <laughs> Markets correspondent. And the point is simply that we're getting closer to an inversion, and people are worried that an inversion of the curve signals a recession to come. Yeah, well, that's not always the case. Yes, it has coincided in the past, but I think one of the concerns here is that we're in an unprecedented situation 
situation. You're going to hear this over and over and over again. When was the last time you had a Russian invasion, a uh, decelerating growth coming off of a pandemic, which, by the way, I think when we talk about the recovery, we should note that when you do have that recovery from the pandemic, the reason demand is so strong across the board, well, it comes because the pandemic shut everything down. It wasn't a typical recession, so it kind of was the equivalent of a kind of pause and play of a movie, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the question here. How much of this is actually a normal economic cycle where you did see everything kind of get flushed out? And I think that's one of the concerns here where the normal metrics, the inversion of the real curve, for example, they don't necessarily apply in the situation. Well, obviously, we're far from normal times. You have somewhat of a policy normalization, whatever that means happening on the monetary front, still a war raging in Ukraine. And yet, as the chart we had up showed, volatility is coming down really across asset classes. How do you make sense of that? Well, it's coming down across asset classes because I hate to say this, but the news flow is changing, right? The conversation is going back to away from the war and it's coming back to can the United States uh, in particular and the West, I should say, really survive some of these commodity shocks that are happening. And at the end of the day, you're seeing that show up in stocks. You're seeing that show up in bonds. The sensitivity to oil prices, although still high, and the sensitivity to broadly commodities, even food prices, although still high, is not tanking the market the way that it used to even, say, a couple weeks ago. And I think that's the mm -hmm. game changer when you look at what some of these bond investors are pricing. Yeah, it does seem as if bond investors, Chrissy, uh, moving to increasingly pricey and early hikes from the Fed. So sort of flat assumption of front loading of hikes as we see commodity prices once again resume their upward path. We've got uh, WTI prices up by just over 4 percent today at 108 being the handle there, nearly 109. Um, what does that tell us, the fact that we're increasingly front loading hike expectations from the Fed? Well, it tells you that there there is a narrative out there that you are starting to see that the Fed can actually handle this. Remember, one of the things, one of the big conversations around this topic has simply been the idea uh, that if even the Federal Reserve does start to hike faster and faster and faster, well, they're not going to be able to really tackle that commodity inflation because at the end of the day, they don't control prices. The only thing they can really do is accelerate that demand destruction. Right now, the way you're seeing the pricing come down, the volatility come down, well, it really tells you that perhaps there is some thought that any hikes coming from the Federal Reserve can can actually tackle the underlying problem. That's why you're seeing a little bit more optimism in the bond market, in the stock market, and dare I say it, a little less volatility in the commodity market. All right, Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, thank you so much for joining us bright and early this morning. Now let's keep you up to date with other news from around the world. Here's the first word. In Hong Kong, the government has scrapped some coronavirus travel curbs and laid out a roadmap to ease social distancing measures. A ban on flights from nine countries, including the U.S. and U.K., will be lifted. Plus, the amount of time travelers spend in mandatory hotel health quarantine will be cut in half. The U.S. reportedly has sent what's called a significant number of Patriot anti-missile interceptors to Saudi Arabia in the last month. According to the Wall Street Journal, the Saudis made an urgent request for the missiles. It had come at a time when U.S.-Saudi relations had gotten worse over a number of issues. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has been hospitalized for an infection. The court says he's expected to be released in a day or two. Thomas is 73 years old and has been on the court since 1991. He's the leader of its conservative wing. There has been a board shakeup at Credit Suisse. Vice Chairman Severin Schwann is st stepping down from his role along with other members of the board. Credit Suisse is still reeling from a series of scandals. Earlier this year, Antonio Horta Osorio was ousted as chairman after just nine months on the job. So that is the saga at Credit Suisse, Anna, that continues to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. The management reshuffles at Credit Suisse continue. Coming up on this program, we will talk about investment strategy from here. Kiran Ganesh, UBS Global Wealth Management, Global Head of Investment Communications, joins us. What does he make of that decline in volatility that you were talking about there, Kaylee, that we have seen over the last week? Can it be sustained? Can it be counted upon as war continues in Ukraine? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. In China, a Boeing 737 flown by China Eastern Airlines has crashed in the southwestern part of the country. The plane was en route to Guangzhou uh, with 132 people on board. There have been no word, uh, has been no word on casualties. 
The war in Ukraine enters a deadly new phase. As Russia's ground campaign gets bogged down, Moscow has begun attacking with hypersonic missiles. Analysts expect Russia to use more air power, and that's likely to lead to more civilian casualties. The focus right now on Mariupol. President Biden will hold a phone call today with the leaders of the UK, France, Italy and Germany. They'll discuss a coordinated response to the latest developments in the war. Meanwhile, the White House will brief executives of ExxonMobil, JP Morgan and other big companies on the war and the impact of sanctions. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines over in New York. A lot to talk about this Monday morning as war continues then in Ukraine. Matt, what's on your mind? Uh, what's on my mind in terms of the markets is the mixed signals that we're kind of getting from futures as well as bonds. Take a look at uh, S&P futures that are down, although they're actually at their best levels of the session right now, so off only one-tenth of one percent. Meanwhile, investors are, are selling debt, so they are letting go of the perceived safety of government bonds. That lets the yield float up to almost 220, two spot 1906. So I think very interesting um, those two signals working against each other. NYMEX crude is up. Um, it's giving up some of the gains that we saw earlier. It was up more than 5 6% earlier at 110. Now we're at 108.52. So still um, significant gains, but not as strong as they had been. And Bitcoin not doing a heck of a lot, but holding at 41,253. So Bitcoin, which has been relatively stable over the past few weeks around this 40,000 level, continues to hold there. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Yeah, Bitcoin definitely staying in a range. Oil, though, that range has been really wide. And with oil moving to the upside today, you are seeing a corresponding move for a lot of those energy stocks in pre-market trading, one of them being Devon Energy, which is higher by the better part of 3%. It is a much larger move to the upside, though, for Anaplan. This is a software company that is being bought by Tama Bravo in a $10.7 billion deal, roughly 30% premium to its closing price on Friday. So that stock is up nearly 27% in early hours as a result. One deal not happening, though, is Nielsen. It is rejecting an acquisition offer from Elliott uh, and, uh, and Brookfield as well. That stock is down 15% as a result. And finally, just checking back on the shares of Boeing as we've been reporting that jet with more than 130 people on it crashing in southwestern China. And as a result, Boeing shares moving to the downside by about 6% in pre-market trading, Anna. And we watch for news on that developing story then, Kaylee. Back to the markets here in Europe. And as Matt was saying, off earlier lows on U.S. futures. And the same applies to European stocks as well. So the stock 600 actually managing to eke out some positive territory here. Of course, London supported by basic resources and energy companies. As we see the prices of oil go higher. And Brent crude also moving to the upside along with WTI this morning. Elsewhere, we have other movements a little higher in some basic resources. And that certainly applies to aluminium or aluminum. Up by 3.7% on the London Metals Exchange this morning. We've seen Canberra in Australia changing its policy on exports of alumina and, and that is one of the key ingredients of course of this metal and so as a result we see that upward pressure. They're no longer able to send that to Russia from Australia. The nickel price in focus down by 15%. That is the limit down. That is the new trading range at least for today that we're allowed to see on the London metals uh, the LME listing of nickel and that does take it a little closer to where it trades in Shanghai so perhaps we are moving through this abnormal period uh, of trading around nickel uh, if uh, if we can head back to something that looks a little more like what's going on in Shanghai, at least. And the Nestle share price in focus, although just managing to come back into positive territory, perhaps. A lot of political pressure on this business. They have withdrawn from part of their business in Russia. They're not sending uh, non-essential items there, but they are still sending what they deem to be more essential food items and baby formula. Uh, but there is some political pressure on them to rethink that policy. Kaylee. All right, Anna. Well, let's talk more macro picture now. Joining us is Kieran Ganesh, multi-asset strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management. Kieran, as we look at all the uncertainty out there on the trajectory of monetary policy, on the trajectory of the war in Ukraine, is it time to go to cash? We think it's best to stay invested at this point, but stay close to long-term strategic asset allocation targets. So we're keeping a neutral stance on equities at the moment. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty out there, as you highlight, and I think that's part of the reason we have moved to neutral. Um, but we've also seen in the past couple of weeks some signs that that uncertainty is starting to ease. We might be past the peak point of uncertainty. We now know a lot more about what the Fed is going to do, China's economic policy, and of course we've seen some evidence of how commodity prices react to uh, the war and Russia's invasion uh, in Ukraine. So it, not all of these things are, are good news clearly, but they do increase certainty for markets and that's an important factor for us.
OK, I suppose getting a handle on that certainty or, or lack of it, Kieran, might depend very much on how long the conflict uh, lasts and what kinds of weaponry are employed. That is something that the market is going to have to keep, a, a keep, a, keep across. Yes, clearly. So I, I think the, the length at which we, we see this conflict uh, continuing and when we see the peak point in sanctions, we think are, are two kind of really important drivers. And because, of course, if you do start to see uh, more uh, uh, harsh weaponry being used and you start to see uh, the US and Europe escalating their sanctions on Russia, then that increases the risk and perhaps the energy supplies do get cut off uh, to Europe, which would drive a recession. Mm. So the length of those uh, uh, of, the, of the conflict and when sanctions peak is an important factor for markets going forward. So do you think we have not seen necessarily peak sanctions, Kieran? We can't make that assumption just yet. Yeah, I don't think we can say that definitively um, at, at this stage because it really depends on where we get to with, with the ceasefire. It has been encouraging to hear that the Ukraine and Russia have been getting a bit closer in some of the uh, talks uh, you know, coordinated by Turkey. And so that sounds like it's uh, moving in a, in a good direction, which could suggest we get there sooner. Um, but I think until we get more certainty we're at that point, um, it's difficult to take a more aggressive risk on stance at this stage. If you have to, if you have cash to put to work, Karen, um, what do you want to buy right now? Are you looking more at preserving your capital or returns? I think you can you can look at both areas. So I think on the capital protection side of things, we think that holding your portfolio of equities and then adding on top of that exposure to broad commodities and to financials, we think makes sense because that those can act as hedges against the war in Ukraine and against rising interest rates. Um, but then on the other hand, if you're looking for areas for excess returns, we're focusing in on some of the areas that we think you know, might see increased demand over the coming years as a result of this new environment of international mistrust. So think things like cybersecurity, green tech and renewables, which should benefit from the trend towards energy security and um, the, these are trends which we think are going to be well supported over the course of the next few years and are an area where investors could earn excess returns what's the risk of recession here and especially here in the u.s um you know and and how how does that impact central banks do they have to turn tail and run yeah, we, we don't think the risk of re recession in the U.S. is actually particularly elevated. I mean, part of that is just because of where we're coming from and that uh, boost to demand uh, as a result of the recovery from coronavirus. So we think that the risk of recession in the U.S. isn't so elevated. Of course, if we do see oil prices moving higher and staying higher for longer, that would increase the risk. But today, uh, we're not too concerned in the U.S. I think Europe is where there is a bit more risk um, because the starting point is lower. The absolute level of growth is, is lower in Europe, of course. Uh, and then you do have additional risk of uh, sanctions or disruptions to energy supplies there really causing a recession. All right, Kieran, thanks so much for joining us. Kieran Ganesh there, multi-asset strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management. Now, President Biden plans to hold a call with European leaders today after Ukraine rejected Russia's demand to surrender the besieged city of Mariupol. Joining us to discuss the war and its economic implications is Adam Tews, Columbia history professor. And Adam, I wanted to start with uh, um, a big, broad question for you on sort of the shakeout here, the possibility of a new world order and a partnership between China and Russia. Are we seeing that dramatic, you know, drop of the Iron Curtain? Do you think that we're at, you know, uh, that point here where there's a shift in paradigms? I think so far Beijing has done absolutely at every, everything it can, bar throw its lot in with the United States, to avoid that scenario. I don't think this was China's game plan. This is something that Moscow essentially foisted on the Chinese. I don't think they're keen on this dynamic and the form that it's taking. They have their own much bigger issues to deal with, um, with the United States. So we're not seeing that kind of block formation, but I think there is a specifically European story here, is that, as your previous guest pointed out, there is, a, I think, a crucial distinction between global conditions, US conditions, and what's happening in Europe. And I think in Europe itself, where, of course, the original Iron Curtain was drawn, I think we can see a return to that kind of model very readily. In fact, it's very difficult to see how relations between the rest of Europe and Russia normalize after this moment. So, Adam, it may be a new political order. What about a new economic order? We have seen an economic chokehold in many ways put on Russia. Will that ultimately make a difference in behavior? 
I think we really have to, to my mind, break this out at different levels. And not, not just a matter of making everything more complicated for the sake of it, but differentiating key levels within the global economy or dimensions. And one is clearly the dollar, the dollar euro, the euro dollar block, or perhaps it's the dollar euro block, which has gripped Russia and, and imposed a huge price on it by way of central bank sanctions. But I think the dynamic of trade, for instance, is resolutely multipolar at this point. The largest trade flows in the world are between the large macro regions, the North American bloc, Mexico, United States, Canada, the East Asian smartphone bloc, for instance, or the European, the larger European system of the oil energy flow. Those don't easily segment into blocks. And then there's a third network which is really the tech security policy intersection, which has become so explosive with regard to West-China relations in the last couple of years. So I, I don't see, as it were, a return to polarized Cold War blocks where you have politics, culture, economy all lined up in a single structure, mm. but rather a series of overlapping multipolar systems. Adam, there's an increasing conversation about Russia being a new pariah country, obviously cut out from the global financial system in many ways. Even if there was a resolution to this conflict, historically, how difficult is it to re-enter the global financial system after being cut off in such dramatic fashion? Well, we really don't have that many cases to work with as examples, right? Because this is re-entry. It's not China, for instance, where, in a sense, China's emergence coincides with globalization. Um, you know, the obvious cases would be, well, well your shortlist is North Korea, Venezuela and Iran. None of them have re-entered. And Russia is a highly, much more significant player than that. At the central bank level, one could imagine almost flicking a switch. But as I was saying, I think the level of outrage, certainly in Europe, around Russia's behavior means that it's very difficult to see that renormalization. How are people going to sit down with Putin again and with those who have been his loyal servants after what we're seeing in the major cities mm. of Ukraine at this moment? That, that's very difficult to conceive of. So even at, though at a technical level it might be conceivable, it's difficult to see you know, why one would do that. And with Russia, the payoff may simply not be significant enough to be worth the political mm. price. And Adam, in terms of how this politically ends, some voices still talking about getting to a place where Putin, President Putin, finds some sort of off-ramp. Maybe that's a, a more pragmatic uh, uh, outcome. Others saying, you know, we need to build a case around war crimes and certainly focusing on what's going on in Mariupol right now. The EU foreign policy spokesman has been talking in those terms. A number of former UK prime ministers talking about trying to build a war crimes case against President Putin. How do we navigate that? Well, I think the priority and the loads, the, the North Star of all our negotiations has got to be ceasefire and then end to the hostilities in Ukraine. And, and you get there by way of Russia being able to claim something like a victory. Whether then after that there are legal ramifications uh, is very difficult to tell. I mean, it's certainly hard to imagine a scenario in which Putin and his entourage feel free to travel, you know, on holiday to anywhere in the West anytime soon. The legal risk for them is just obviously too huge. There is no possibility, presumably, of a lasting peace unless, um, um, uh, unless as it were, they are given some degree of safe harbour. Um, but I don't see them becoming free-moving citizens of the world from here mm. on out. Um, they're going to be just mm. in too great a degree of jeopardy. Adam, thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. Adam Tews, Professor of History at Columbia University. Coming up on this pro on uh, programming today, in fact, Latvian Minister of Defence, Artis Pabriks. That's at 8.30 a.m. New York time, 12.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with Naftogaz CEO Yuri Vitrenko. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 2.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Well, Matt, Anna, as we know, it's a little bit difficult to find hedges these days, specifically hedges against inflation. And there was a narrative out there that maybe Bitcoin 
is one. However, in a Bloomberg survey, it is actually last in a survey of popular inflation hedges. Eddie Vanderwalt, Bloomberg Markets Live editor, is joining us now. So, Eddie, 886 respondents, just 4% said Bitcoin offers the best inflation hedge now. Has it been acting in that way? I, I absolutely has not been acting in that way. But what's really surprising to me was that there's no split, there's no distance between retail investors and professional investors. Neither of those categories see Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. But that doesn't mean that they're yeah. not buying it, right? It means that they are buying it for a different reason. They are buying it, you know, because they believe in the technology or whatever. But but it really punctures Eddie. a final hole in that narrative. No, come on, come man. on. You, you've got to, you've got to... <laughs> Let me, Eddie, come on. How many of the people in your survey were from Zimbabwe? Venezuela or Russia in the last three weeks. I mean, let's be real, right, right? The people buying this as an inflation hedge aren't rich people in Western markets, but people who are facing hyperinflation and don't even have access to the other things in your survey. Right. As, as a hedge against absolute currency collapse, yes, that, that, I, I, I grant you that. You know, we, and we do split it geographically, we, but, we do, but, but not to the, to the point of, of, of say, Zimbabwe. I think, I think what we're looking at, though, is that if you're in a place like that, then any hard asset is an inflation hedge, right? Whether you're buying property or whether you're buying U.S. shares, the, it's, it's just the accessibility of those things. But I think when we're looking, when, we, when we're asking investors in the current inflationary environment, in, you know, that we're seeing um, in the West, they are not buying Bitcoin for those reasons. They are buying Bitcoin for other reasons. And, Eddie, uh, interesting in your survey that, yes, inflation is in there as a concern, but the biggest concern, and they are linked, of course, is war, and actually described as the biggest underpriced risk in right. your survey, which is really interesting when we think about how much we priced in war in Ukraine and then pulled back from that. Right, and I think, that, I think the, the, the worry is some sort of escalation here, right? And w what is interesting is we asked the same question back in December, and then the big fear was inflation followed by COVID. And both of those things have been overtaken. Stagflation is something that people mention a lot now, but even counting that in, war is absolutely the biggest risk for, for, for investors at the moment. Yeah, absolutely uh, the most important story the, and the worst story to cover as well. Eddie, thanks so much for joining us. Eddie Vandervald of Bloomberg Markets Live talking to us about um, the way people view digital currencies. And for more on the world of decentralized finance, watch our new show, Bloomberg Crypto, that airs every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time. Tomorrow we're going to speak with uh, author and notable crypto skeptic James Rickards, as well as Perry Ann Boring, the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, Obamacare may be uh, behind a healthier labor market and stronger income growth in states that have embraced the program since it came online in 2014. For more, Matt Winkler, our editor-in-chief emeritus, joins us now on set here in New York. Matt, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, let me ask first about how many, you know, what's the breakdown look like? Because not all states... Um, accepted federal money to help pay for an expansion in Medicaid, which is really what we're talking about. Um, how many and why not? So we've got 39 states now, including the District of Columbia, if it was a state, who have embraced fully Obamacare, which is specifically the Medicaid expansion, which takes care of all these people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford assurance. Those states, including the District of Columbia, have outperformed what we call the 12 holdouts, who from the beginning, Obamacare is now more than a decade old, uh, resisted, refused, still do, led by Texas and Florida, that Medicaid expansion. And the 39 have outperformed in income growth and employment growth, the 12 that have held out. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because you like to think if we're all healthy, we're going to be more productive, we're going to work harder, and we're going to get back to work. Well, and if um, I'm already taking care of health insurance-wise, it's much easier for me to get a job. My employer then doesn't have to pay for it. Well, that's true, too. This is particularly relevant to, if you like, working women who are mothers as well. And one of the uh, real 
if you like, disasters of the COVID-19 epidemic was that so many of these people were unable to get back to work easily because they worried about child care. Obamacare takes care of a lot of that. Mm. Uh, uh, Matt, great to, to speak to you this morning. I wonder, so it's a really fascinating uh, study then that you've conducted here on the income and employment growth effects of adopting this policy. Uh, can we be sure that this isn't just uh, driven by another policy difference? Cause, because I imagine, thinking about Texas and Florida, there are many policy differences between that part of the United States and the places that have adopted Obamacare. Well, what's, um, if you like, reassuring about the data is we've got, we've got many years' worth, okay? It's been uh, since 2010 that Obamacare actually was uh, in existence in 2014 when it was fully embraced. And that's a long time. Texas, by the way, has the highest uninsured rate in the country, more than 18 percent. Almost one in five people who live in Texas are uninsured. It's right. unbelievable. And, and what's interesting is even though, as you well know, people are moving to Texas for jobs, at the same time, employment growth in Texas does not measure up to, say, Massachusetts, the Bay State, which has the lowest uninsured rate in the country, just over 3%. So there's a real marked contrast that where you have health care fully implemented, you have employment growth and personal income growth rising dramatically more than states that have resisted the full benefits of Obamacare. Mm. Matt, thank you very much. Thanks for bringing us your story. Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief Emeritus, Matt Winkler. More Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. We will be hearing from Latvia's Defence Minister and Amrita Sen of Energy Aspects, among others. Really interesting conversation to talk to uh, the Latvian minister then, given the fears in the Baltic region about where violence in Ukraine, where the war in Ukraine goes from there. Amrita Sen, interesting to get her thoughts on what's happening in oil, with oil prices, up by more than 3% on both WTI and Brent. The handle on WTI, 108 right now, up by 3.4% compared to Friday's close. Basic resources and energy stocks doing well here in Europe, fairly flat overall on this market. This is Bloomberg.